pending for the past month. And uh, we have absolutely loved it here. Thank you so much for going out of your way to welcome us and our, our little girls. Today we will be reading in the book of Exodus, chapter 18. If you open up your congregational Bible, it is on page 57. We'll be reading the entire chapter, so get comfortable. It is chapter 18 on page 57 of the Bible in your seat, and it goes like this. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And as they stood round him from morning till evening, when his father-in-law saw all Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand round you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men, and hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them serve as judges for the people at all times, but let them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his own way, and Jethro returned to his own country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you very much, Uh, Ross, for reading that so engagingly. You've been sitting for a while, so do you want to stand up, stretch your legs for a bit? And we're looking forward to, soon we'll be able to sing inside again, and, um, and uh, we can sort of stand up and sit down a bit more in the service, but I'm aware it's hot, quite hard sitting for a while, you can now sit down. Um, it's, a, it's a small mercy, isn't it? <laughs> um, am I quite loud? Can you, are you okay? I sound quite loud. Good. Okay, wonderful. I, I can go down, says Mark. Excellent. Thank you. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be doing this strange sort of um, series. Normally at CCB, we choose a book of the Bible, and we work through it verse by verse, passage by passage, all the way through. And, and normally that, that's what we do. Um, but what we're doing um, over the, over the po- well, this is the final week of three weeks, is thinking about a topic, a topical series about growth. We thought about how God has, has grown us numerically, and how we still have a responsibility to care for one another, and ensure that happens. We thought about how God is growing us in diversity and how we need to harness that diversity and not be threatened by it. And today we're thinking about how God is seeking to grow us in collectivity, which is a a posh way of saying we we need to think about how we delegate uh, together, delegate ministry. And this is a useful passage, isn't it? Um, So it's quite nuts and bolts. It's not not usual for us, but hopefully it's it's, it's encouraging nonetheless. And one one I lead us in, in prayer. Father God, I pray that as your spirit speaks to us now through your word, through my weak words, Lord, would we hear your voice? I pray, Lord, we'd be encouraged in our own personal witness. I pray, Father, we'd be encouraged as as a witness of our church and that we'll be moved to action, to think about how we can better organize ourselves um, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the lost who don't yet know you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Martin Lewis. I might have a, a photo of him up on the screen. Uh, back in 2003, he set up a website called moneysavingexpert.com. Hands up if you use moneysavingexpert.com. I use it whenever I have to renew my phone contract and go, oh, this is the one to go for. Gift gap, always. And, and since then, basically, this website has helped millions of people with their finances. He's fought landmark consumer cases. He frequently tops the polls of Britain's most trustworthy voice. Martin Lewis is an extraordinary man. I, I read an interview uh, in the Times uh, with him not too long ago. And he describes how, for some people, he's become almost a messianic figure. He, he kind of walks down the road, and people recognize him from TV, and they fall at his knees. Uh, one lady said this, you're a god, I do just whatever you say. Now this sort of pressure has kind of built this sort of um, messiah complex, which has kind of been foisted upon him. And particularly over the last year with the COVID uh, epidemic, the, the government have gone to him and he's really helped them think about the furlough scheme and how to make it as good as possible. And he describes in this interview how he's carrying people's despair 24 Seven, working crazy long hours. He said this in the interview, sometimes it gets too much. I found myself in tears too often at my computer, looking at 300,000 unopened emails from people in need, because I just don't know how to help people. Now, I'll begin with that, because I wonder how often you you feel there's a similar weight or burden on us as Christians. Um, We might have heard earlier how how throughout the whole Bible, God has this plan for for his people to be a witness to the nations. In the Old Testament, the strategy is is come in here. God's people are are to be like a magnet, drawing in the nations by their holy living. And in the New Testament, the, the strategy is go and tell. Go and tell of the Lord's forgiveness All the way through Old Testament, New Testament, God's people are to be a blessing to the nations. So that's always been the calling, but that can sometimes be a burden, can't it? Because as we think about it, we might just feel completely overwhelmed by the sheer scale of need. Imagine Martin Lewis staring at those 300,000 emails. Well, Consider how many people you walk past in your week who don't know Jesus and have no way of salvation. Consider the number of your colleagues, the people on the tube. It's overwhelming. It's, it, we struggle even to compute it. Forget 300,000 emails. How many millions in our city don't know Christ? And then think about the scale of the need. We, we think about just how finite and, and small we are. We're just a drop in the ocean. We only have a limited number of hours in our week to to, to rest, uh, to work, uh, to play. And on top of that, to to go and tell of of God's forgiveness uh, to to those around us. It it can, can't it, feel like a, a burden. 
it could feel a burden on an individual level. I think it also could sometimes feel a burden on, on, a, on a church level. Every now and then, churches feel guilty about, oh, we've got to go and tell the gospel, we've got to do more things. And, and so we come up with new outreach initiatives, at which point we kind of have a sneaking suspicion that these outreach initiatives, they're going to be led by the same sort of people, the same conscientious souls who, who end up leading most other things because they're, they're really driven, and, and they end up feeling especially burdened, and they end up burning out. And we think this, the same thing happens again. So how do we cope with the scale of the problem, the spiritual need, and, and, and the size of our own individual capacity? And it's fair to say the Bible gives a number of different answers to that question. Um, sometimes the, the, the Bible reassures us that God, our Father, is in complete sovereign control. He reassures us to say, look, God has an elect. He has those whom he will save. And, and that is a massive comfort to us. Uh, when we're fretting about the scale of the need, we go, no, God is in control. That's a good message to hear. Sometimes we're reminded that we have the Holy Spirit that the Spirit is in us, He is with us, He's emboldened us, emboldened us, and sometimes we need to kind of get a kick up the bottom to say, no, we really need to get up and out and, and proclaim the good news. Sometimes we need that challenge, don't we? But there is a third answer to this problem, and it, it's not an th- answer we often come across, which is why we're doing this passage here today. The third solution to this problem of massive need and the, and the scale of our capacity, yes, God is sovereign, Yes, we're to be bold with the Spirit, but thirdly, yes, we need to get organized. We need to organize ourselves better. So that's why we're in Exodus 18. Um, To catch up to speed on the plot so far, if you're new to Christian things, let me fill you in on what's been going on so far in the book of Exodus. God's people were slaves in Egypt, but God miraculously has rescued them that, redeemed them, taken them out. And they've been wandering through the desert for some time now, but they've now arrived at Mount Sinai, where they're now free to worship God, free to sacrifice to him. And at this point, we are reminded God's people are redeemed in order to bless the nations. That's our first heading, if you're following on the back of your handouts. The redeemed bless the nations. So would you look back with me, um, it's uh, page 57, if you closed your Bibles, open it back up again, and um, follow the story with me. Ross read it so well a moment ago, um, so we'll gloss over certain parts. Um, but uh, Exodus 18 and verse 1 says this, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for the people of Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent his wife, Zipporah, his, away, his father-in-law, Jephro, received her and her two sons. And then skip down to verse 5. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Now, on the surface, this seems like the end of a Disney movie. It's like the, the schmaltzy scene where the family kind of have a lovely reunion and affecting music is played and there's a solitary tear running down your cheek. Because for a long while now, Zipporah and, his, and, and, and her two boys have been separated from their dad, been separated from Moses. We, we don't know why. It, it might be because Moses figured that, hey, this exodus business might be a bit dangerous, you know, confronting Pharaoh with these plagues. Yeah, maybe I'm going to take my wife and children and send them off to my father-in-law off in Midian. Maybe that's what he was thinking. But, but now, now the exodus is over. Now they're at Mount Sinai. Now there's this happy reunion once again. Hooray. And we're given a reminder of the boys' names. I think because their names offer us hope for the future. Gershom's name reminds us of when Moses was homeless, living in Midian. But soon they're not going to be homeless anymore because they're on their way to their permanent home, the promised land. It's good news. And Eliezer, the other name of the other boy, his name reminds us of when Pharaoh was breathing down Moses' neck, but now Pharaoh's done with, he's dealt with, and God has saved them. God has helped his people. Good news. End of a Disney movie. But there's more to it here than that, isn't there? It's much more than just a family reunion. Notice in verse 1, as you look down, how Jethro is described. 
He's described as the priest of Midian. Moses' father-in-law is not an Israelite. He is among, he's from the Gentile nations. And he isn't just a worshipper of, of other gods, as the other nations did. He's a high priest in the worship of those other gods. Jethro represents, if you like, the nations who don't know God, don't worship God, and instead worship false gods. One of the, one of the big bad things in the book of Exodus. So some scholars, they kind of speculate that maybe this was the real reason why Moses sent Zipporah and her boys away from him. We're not told why, but some people speculate it wasn't for their protection from Pharaoh, but because of the theological tension in the marriage. Zipporah, having been raised in a family, worshipping other gods, her dad, the high priest of those other gods, and, and Moses trying to faithfully serve the one true God. May, may, some people speculate maybe that's the tension there, so he sent her away. So there's this question, who, who will the family worship? Who will Zipporah and, and, and Jethro and the boys worship? Will they worship the gods of Midian, or, or will they worship Yahweh? Only in the previous chapter, as you look back to chapter 17, there's an almighty battle between the Israelites and a pagan nation, the Amalekites, who didn't want the Israelites coming into their land. And so here's the question, how will Midian respond to the, the, all the Israelites coming their way? How will Midian respond? Well, here we get our answer. Look at verse 6. Jethro had sent word ahead to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. And we have a bit of tension here. Are they hostages? You know, or, or is this actually the happy Disney reunion we're, we're sort of hoping for? We don't know. We don't know. Verse 7. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and they went into the tent Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. I think there's a lot we can learn from Moses here about how it is that we witness to the friends and, and neighbors who, who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's sad, isn't it, that the popular image of Christians on, in the media is, is, is particularly evangelical, Bible-believing Christians, is, is that we're kind of smug, aloof, and self-righteous. Smug, aloof, and self-righteous. That's often how we're, how we're portrayed, isn't it, in, in comedy and things like that. But, but look how, how Moses responds to his unbelieving father-in-law. He, he doesn't treat Jephro like a leper simply b- because he believes in other gods. No, he warmly embraces him. He makes it really clear that despite their enormous ethnic and cultural and religious differences, they can be friends. So we too should go without saying. So we, should, we too should warmly invite our friends and neighbours into our lives, into our homes. They might believe different stuff. They might look very different to us. They might believe very different stuff. But sharing our lives with them as well as our message is so important, isn't it? And when Moses opens his mouth and, and shares his testimony, he doesn't make himself the hero of the story. He could have done. Moses is quite a big figure in the book of Exodus. He did do some pretty cool stuff, but he doesn't make himself the hero, does he? No, he's very clear how the Lord, Yahweh, rescued them from Pharaoh. And nor does he make out that no, having been saved, life is now really great and really easy. No, he's very real about that. He says, no, the Lord has preserved us through many hardships. Life as the redeemed people of God in the desert is hard. But God's kept us going. I think we too, when we get these opportunities to share something of our story with our friends or our neighbours who don't know Jesus, we can be real with them. We can show our vulnerability. In fact, I think we must show our vulnerability to them. Be honest about our pasts, our sin. Be honest about how difficult we find it in the present. We don't need to say, ah, it's all great now. 
because they know it's not all great now. We're not in heaven yet, are we? I think by doing this, by showing a vulnerability, it can be incredibly disarming and invites them to lean forward and think, well, wow, well, they've found a rescuer. They've found a sustainer. Well, I do too. That's what I need. Just just notice the effect it has on on Jethro, verse 9. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord, Yahweh, who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. For he did this to those who he had treated Israel arrogantly. Now that word know there in verse 11 is is really, really significant. It's really important. Even though Jethro wasn't there, he didn't witness the plagues of Egypt, did he? He he wasn't there when the Red Sea parted. He he didn't see any of that stuff with his his own eyes. Through Moses' testimony, he came to know the Lord God. And knowledge isn't just an informational thing. It's not like he read Israel's Wikipedia page and went, yeah, okay, I know everything here. No, it's a relational knowledge. It's the same word used in, in Genesis for, for when Adam knew his wife Eve, that, that sort of intimate knowledge. He says, now I've heard the story. I now know the Lord. And he didn't just add the Lord to you know, his existing pantheon of all the other Midianite gods, and there's Yahweh, he's the, up there with you know, all the other ones. No, he... He knows that Yahweh alone is supreme. Yahweh alone is to be worshipped. And to that extent, I guess Jethro's experience here is the same as every believer here in this room. We weren't ourselves witnesses of Christ's death and resurrection, were we? We weren't there, unless you're really old. I don't think, Gordon, you're that old, are you? Not quite. Sorry, I have to be mean about Gordon at least once a month. We weren't there. We weren't there when these things happened. But but through the humble testimony of others, we haven't just come to know about God. We've come to know him. Come to believe in him. We haven't just added him to the existing pantheon of all the other things we think are important in our lives. He isn't just one God amongst many, alongside career and worship, uh, and sorry, relationships and uh, you know, holidays, wherever it might be. No, we make God, the Lord God, Jesus Christ, supreme above them all. We've turned away from those other gods that we might worship him alone. And isn't it striking what Jethro does next? Verse 12. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. Isn't it funny? Jethro's very first instinct, having known the Lord God, is to make a sacrifice. Now, we aren't told explicitly here, but but later in the Bible, we, we learn the, the, the meaning of a burnt offering. Jethro must have offered this because he knew that God's anger at his sin had to be turned away somehow. And Jethro knew that he should die because of his sin, but he knew that, 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 that there needs to be a substitute for that. And so he offers up this sacrifice to God for that purpose, to die in his place. And the result of that sacrifice isn't just forgiveness with God on the sort of the the vertical axis. It's also fellowship with the Israelites. The priest, the once pagan priest of Midian, now eating with Moses and Aaron around the holy tabernacle of God, in the presence of God. This is full fellowship, vertical, horizontal. This is beautiful. Now, it might seem strange, but this verse, verse 12, it can be seen as pretty much the climax of the book of Exodus. 
Because when, when God first met Moses in the burning bush, he told him, right, I'm going to take your people out of Egypt. And the purpose of that is so that my people might sacrifice to me at this mountain. I, I'm going to rescue this so that, so that the nations might see that I alone am to be worshipped. Little do we expect that the very first sacrifice offered at Mount Sinai is offered by Jethro from the pagan nations. Here is the fulfillment of the book of Exodus. God's people were redeemed in order that the nations might know him. I read the amazing story this past week of a, a mountain rescue on Mount Everest. Uh, Mount Everest. There's a 24-year-old guy um, called Nadav ben Yehuda, and he wanted to be the youngest ever Israeli uh, to climb the mountain. And uh, he was near the top. I think he was about 1,000 feet uh, away from the top, and he was about to make the final climb to the very summit, but he decided not to, because as he looked out, he saw, if we have the next slide, he saw, I don't know if you see the, the quality, you see this enormous queue. It, it's, they, they call it a deadly bottleneck because you literally have to stand there in zero oxygen environment waiting for, you know, for this, for, to basically to climb up. So he looked at the queue and went, nah, I'm going to go tomorrow. So he went back, went back to the camp at the foot of the summit and um, there he just spent the evening and he spent the evening eating with various other climbers from, from different nations. Uh, the next day, he made his ascent once more. He wanted to be the youngest Israeli, 24 years old, to ever reach the top of Mount Everest. And as he was near, nearing the top, he looked to his left, and there on the left was a 64-year-old Turkish man called Aidin Imrak, lying in the snow. Aidin was without gloves, without oxygen, and without any shelter. Now, that altitude, there's, there's no oxygen, so they call it the death zone. Exposure here leads to mountain sickness, madness, which is probably why he took off his gloves, took away his shelter, threw off his mask. He was wheezing, he was dying. And all the other climbers, focused on the summit, walked straight past Imrak. But here our young man, Nadav, he decided to relinquish his summit bid, relinquish his world record and help the man back down uh, to the base camp in the mountain. It took nine hours, but he lived, um, surviving with um, nearly all of his fingers. I think we've got a, a photo of him. There he is, um, <laughs> Nadav, the Israeli, and um, Imrak, the Turkish man. Now, the, what makes this story extraordinary is that, is that, of course, normally these two nations hate one another. Israelis hate Turks. Uh, take, Turks hate Israelis. And so the media back home, they're really excited that, that the Nadav will be completing this, this, uh, this record for, for Israel. And then he threw it away for you know, a 64-year-old Turkish man. What a waste. When they're interviewing Nadav about why he did this, he's, he's, it, it turns out that the, on the previous day when he, uh, when he decided not to make the mountain bid, he went back to camp. Apparently he had a meal. Uh, they, they ate a meal together in the camp, and Nadav said, he is my brother. Our souls are now linked together. So eating that meal was what led him to do that. Now, Nadav's sacrifice of that summit bid, it, it's not really much of a sacrifice when you compare it to the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our Savior, he didn't just forego glory by trying to climb a mountain. Our Saviour, he left heaven, he took on our humanity, and he went to the cross for us. He, he acted like Jethro's burnt offering. As Christ died upon the cross, he, he took God's anger, the full force of it, at our sin. He bore that in his body. He bore that as a substitute so that we don't have to. See, that is a true sacrifice, isn't it? And he didn't just forgive us. He didn't just allow us to be forgiven by God on that vertical axis. He also united us with one another on the horizontal axis. So isn't it interesting that uh, the meal which the Lord Jesus Christ left us with is a sign of both those axes. 
in the Lord's Supper, we not only participate in Jesus' sacrifice and remember it, we also gather around the table together as a family, as a multi-ethnic, multinational family of God. You've got your Israelites there as well as your, your Midianites. <laughs> You've got your Nigerians with cola and your Brits like me. You, you, you see, this is a multi-ethnic, multinational because that is the family of God. That's the point. The Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't just forgive us. He invites us to a meal. And I I need to say, if you're here today and you're not yet trusting in Jesus Christ, maybe maybe you are worshipping other things, and and maybe you see that they can't save. Maybe Jeffro realized that, didn't he? My God can't save. Only Yahweh can save. Maybe today is the day you need to let go of those gods and worship Yahweh alone, worship Jesus alone. Because he has provided a sacrifice for you. Is there anything stopping you today from trusting in him? We are the redeemed people of God. He invited us into a meal, into fellowship with him. In order that we might save the nations. But here's the surprising twist in the second half of the chapter. Yes, the redeemed Save the nations, outreach to the nations, bless the nations. The surprising in the second half is that the redeemed, the organized, bless the nations. That's our second heading. The organized bless the nations. So follow with me, verse 13. It's where the passage really changes, and it's quite strange. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning until evening. When his father-in-law saw that all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Well, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. I love Jephro. Moses' father-in-law replied, Yeah, yeah, what you're doing is not good. (laughs) You and the people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. It's fascinating, isn't it? Moses, sorry, Jephro has only just come to faith. But clearly he he brings some wisdom with him. He's a priest in Midian, but he brings some leadership skills with him, which... Clearly, Moses never received in, in the courts of Pharaoh. And he notices there's a massive problem with God's people. Justice isn't happening. And it isn't happening because Moses is the bottleneck. Moses believes that he and he alone can reveal God's will to the people. And that he and he alone has the ability to decide and adjudicate to all the different disagreements between them, whether big or small. Moses thinks he's the one guy who can do it all. And now think of it, when, when the, peop, the number of God's people reaches hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, can you imagine how long that line would have been? How tedious that work would have been? It's a little surprise that Moses is overstretched. It's a little surprise that he's burning out. And and actually, on the other end of things, the people of God aren't being cared for either. They're not getting justice either. Justice delayed is justice denied. So Jeffro comes up with, you know, he recognizes the problem here, his sort of managerial consultancy hat on. He goes, yeah, there's something not right here. It's not really working, is it, Moses? And and he sort of comes up with with a solution. But I don't think he does this simply for the sake of his daughter and his children. I I think you need more quality time. And I'm going to come up with a solution. We're not told his motive here, but I suspect that his design is bigger than that. The stakes are much bigger. You see, if if God's law isn't being heard by the people, if if God's good justice is not being seen and lived out among the people, if God's people aren't able to live out justice among themselves, then here's the problem. The nations won't get saved. 
See, this was the plan in the Old Testament, it, that God's people uh, would witness to the surrounding nations through their distinctive living, through their holy laws. And by being such a, a light, such a powerful witness among the nations, the nations would be drawn in. And, and Jephthah is going, well, that's not going to work, is it? Because no one's hearing the word of God, and, and no one's really getting it applied. And, and it's just not working, is it? So the first half of our passage is about blessing to the nations. Well, let's not think the second half is completely different. The second half of our passage shows us that God's people need to be organized in order for blessing to reach the nations. Now, this is where it gets relevant for us and why we've chosen this passage for our series. You see, there is a common problem in churches where the leadership, the pastor or the staff team or the eldership, whatever it might be, the leadership can very easily and very quickly become the bottleneck. In many churches, it's the staff team or, or the leaders who, who, who are everything, who, who are the pioneers of every initiative, who have to action everything, who, who do all the teaching, all the preaching. And, and what, what's the result? Well, very quickly, they burn out, and God's people aren't cared for, and the nations aren't reached. And you see it again and again and again. I have friends elsewhere who have tried to, who've taken over churches, and they're burning out. People aren't being cared for. Their neighbors aren't being reached with the good news. Now, I praise God that is not the culture and has never been, as far as I'm aware, here at CCB. We very much believe in every member ministry. Uh, I've arrived here three and a half years ago, and, and pretty much since I've arrived, you know, people, that's been the culture of disciple-making disciples. I think that's even the tagline of our church, disciple-making disciples of Jesus Christ in Balaam for the world. That's what we're about and you see that in the way we run our connect groups. It isn't just staff team leading the small groups, is it? I think, we, Johnny, how many small groups have we got next year? 15 small groups. What are, what are we now? 12 small groups. We're going to 15 small groups. And only three of those are led by staff. That's an enormous amount of lay leaders. And we need them. And it works brilliantly. It isn't just staff team who are reading the Bible one-to-one -one with people. A number of you are. It's brilliant to see that, that every member ministry happening. It's fantastic that every Sunday by Sunday, everyone is being involved, everyone serving in different ways. But as I come to reflect, I think there are some ways we could be doing this better. And I think as we continue to grow, I think we don't address these problems. That, that Well, it will result in the leaders burning out, the church not being cared for, and the nations not being reached. The nations in Balaam. Can I give you two examples um, one is in terms of how, a bottleneck in terms of our serving on Sunday. So, so Johnny here is, um, is very musical. We saw him play guitar. I think it was it Lila who was very impressed with Johnny's playing skills. He had a fantastic mini minute prophecy about, about Johnny's abilities there. Johnny's a phenomenal musician. Unfortunately, he's also the assistant minister, uh, which means he, he also has to preach a lot and teach a lot and run the, run the midweek program, which means even though we have a vast number of musicians in our church, a number of professional musicians... If it's all on Johnny to run the music, well, we haven't had the capacity to really make that excellent, to, 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 to really push that music ministry on to what it really should be. We have the, the resources, we have the people, but if it's all on Johnny, he can't do it, and he hasn't been able to do it, because he'd be doing other more important things. Um, another example, um, we, we, we launched a year ago a social media team, and amongst us, a number of people are really savvy on social media, you know, Megan with her Instagram skills, and, you know, and um, the, was it Becca with her video skills. We've we got amazingly gifted people, but as an idiot, I put myself as the leader of the team. Um, I know nothing, and, which basically means everyone's sort of waiting for, to, to get a call from Andy, so, oh, can we have an Instagram about that, or, oh, can we have a post about this, or, oh, maybe we can have a video about that, but because I'm busy doing other stuff, it hasn't happened. This is an example. We're just not doing what we should be doing because the wrong person's in charge. Or maybe thinking more about outreach, not just serving in this church, but, but more evangelistic outreach. Um, we have uh, Lizzie, our, our part-time uh, children's worker. He's fantastic. We run that boppers ministry to mums and toddlers. We would love to start an after-school club um, for all the, the children in our, in our area. Many parents want their kids to go to something after school so they can work longer. And we can provide that, and we can tell people about Jesus. We can witness to families a gaping hole in our ministry we're not doing. But Lizzie can't do it. 
She only works three days a week. She's already at capacity running the, mid, uh, the Sunday ministry as well as, well as the, the boppers ministry. What, what do we do? We need to find a leader. We have the people with the skills. We have parents who can invite friends along. But we need a leader. So what is uh, Jethro's advice? Does he say to Moses, okay, Moses, here's what you need to do. You just need to suck it up. <laughs> Work harder. Come on. If you really love the Lord, you'll be more sacrificial. And how many times have we heard sermons like that? We, you kind of feel you're already at capacity, and then, and then someone stands up and says, you know, you could give a little bit more. You, you do have one afternoon free, don't you? You could give that to the... And you're thinking, oh. Now, some of us maybe need that kick up the backside because we're not doing anything. But others of us who are really conscientious just feel the burden. Does Jethro say, suck it up? No. Does he say, Moses, relax, just go to the Lord, seek his will, I'm sure it'll be fine, God is sovereign. No, he doesn't say that. He gives him some worldly advice from the world of Midian, of all places. Some secular advice, which he says, look, if it works with God's will, go with it. And what he essentially says, we won't read it, but, but he says, um, choose godly leaders. Verse 21, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times. Have them bring you every difficult case. The simple ones, they can decide for themselves. That will make your load lighter. Yeah, obviously. Because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain. and All these people will go home satisfied. Maybe you've known leaders in the past who struggle to delegate. I don't know if you've known leaders like that, maybe in work, maybe in churches, I don't know. Leaders who struggle to delegate. Sometimes this is a problem, isn't it? Why, we might ask, why hadn't Moses thought of, to do this before? Um, sometimes we struggle to delegate because we're proud. And uh, we like to be the ones doing everything. And we like being in charge. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's a lack of trust in others. We can't trust anything to others in case it might fail. We need to do everything. And sometimes it's just control. We struggle to let go of control. And for Martin Lewis, I mentioned earlier, moneyexpert.com, uh, uh, he said, uh, he said uh, in this interview, uh, three days before his 12th birthday, um, his mother went out on a horse uh, riding expedition. She got hit by a car and died. Tragic. And as Martin traces back his life... He, he remembers how he was so shell-shocked that pretty much apart from going to school, he never left the house. Because, because he was out the day his mum died when, he was hit by, when she was hit by a car, he figured, well, I have to therefore stay at home and nothing bad will happen. That was the way he sought to control circumstances. And he, he identifies that's why, as he went on in life, he became so controlling and he, and he struggled to delegate, he struggled to let go, he struggled to give over because he had to maintain control. Christian leaders, we can delegate because we know we don't have to be in control. God is in control. This is his church. It's not my church. Christian leaders can let things go. We can fail because we have a God who forgives us. In fact, we see the Lord Jesus Christ modeling this. Who does he choose to go and spread the gospel amongst the nations? Eleven uneducated fishermen. Why, why would you choose them? He delegates, he empowers, he sends out. So the criteria we've we, we got to look for in leaders is, is not just capability. Often in church life, we, someone comes along who's really, really gifted and really great, and we put them in leadership, and, and, if the, and then we discover later, actually, they've got this real character issue. Jethro's advice is look for character first. Look for godly people first. Don't be quick, the Apostle Paul says, to put people into leadership. Look for character first, trustworthy, fear God, hate dishonest gain, whether that's financial or maybe pride uh, in terms of their ego, gain for themselves in that way. With the look for people who, who know their limitations, these, these elders, they weren't just to um, 
do all the cases. They, they, they've got to recognize when the case is beyond their skill and delegate upwards and go, actually, Moses, you take this one. This is too complex for me. And that's what they do. As this plan is, is actioned, we see judges over all the various different sizes of society on, on a tribal level, on a clan level, and on a family level. On every different level, there, there are leaders operating and, and ensuring that justice is happening amongst God's people. And what that means is that on every different level, from the family, to the clan, to the tribe, to the nation. God's people are living justly. They're living holy lives. They're living beautifully. And the effect of that, the nations are drawn in. They hear about the Saviour. So what does this mean for us here at CCB? Well, of course, there's big differences between this passage and, and us here Please don't think for a moment I'm some sort of divine mediator like Moses. I, I'm not. You'll be very glad to hear. Um, nor are we trying to set up a theocracy um, here at CCB. We're not. You'll be very glad to hear. So there are massive differences, but there are some principles which I'd love to seek us to apply as we think about the next stage of life here at CCB. Um, in particular, we want to launch something called Team Ministry. So at the moment, we have a whole bunch of rotors for all the different ministries. But what we've recognized is basically the staff team are running those ministries. And basically, we're not able to pursue excellence in them, like the music or, or the social media. And nor we're able to start new initiatives because we're already at max capacity. What we need to find are leaders, lay leaders, who aren't current, already currently serving in lots of different ways as elders or connect group leaders. We need lay leaders who are godly, who have a passion to spread the gospel amongst the nations. And our hope is as we find these sorts of leaders, leaders who can take initiative, uh, leaders who can, who can manage a team and, and have ideas, leaders who are happy to be accountable to the staff team when, when they've got questions, that as we come up with these initiatives, that, that we find leaders like this, that we'll be able to have so many more outreach initiatives. So in the SHAPE survey, which I mentioned earlier on, those of you who have done it already, there's a section at the end talking about all these initiatives which we'd love to do. But as if it's just down to the staff team, none of them will happen. But if you have a passion for board gaming, well, could you lead that board game cafe? If you have a passion for, for five-a-side football, could you lead that five-a-side football? Uh, if you have a real heartbeat for, for children's uh, outreach, well, could you lead the Arts of School Club? Or at least be a part of it, co-leading it maybe. Do you see, the redeemed people of God, we are to bless the nations. But as we grow as the church, as a church, we'll only do that if we get organized. And that's kind of what we need to think about now. We're going to do this slowly. We're going to do it incrementally. There's not going to be a big scary launch and a big change. It's going to happen slowly over time. But what we'd love you to do, particularly those of you, maybe you feel you have untapped potential and you'd love to use gifts in certain ways, well, please fill in that survey. Let us know. And over time, we want to find leaders that we might together uh, reach Balaam with the good news of Jesus Christ. Someone who really had an impact on me, um, and I'll close with this story, uh, was my, uh, um, the principal of my theological college uh, called Mike Ovi. Um, he died about four or five years ago, very suddenly, um, age 58. And... Um, Mike Obey is a phenomenal mind. I think we have a, an image of him probably later on in the slides, uh, if you skip all the way forward. Keep going, keep going. That's it. And um, he, had a, he had a big impact. So he, he's a phenomenal mind, a uh, theologian. And yet the strange thing is, despite decades in academia, he only ever published one or two books, small little monographs. And, and that wasn't because he just wasn't very good at academic, academic theology. He was a phenomenal mind leading the, the theological college I went to. But rather than being known throughout the world as a famous theologian and author, John Stott, Jim Packer, Mike Ovi, he was content to bring glory to God by training up the next generation of Christian leaders. I was invited to his funeral, and one of the things which someone said in his eulogy was that his books were his students'. His books were his students. 
And now he's died, actually. He's had multiple works published posthumously, bits of paper left on his desk, which someone's managed to scrabble together. But his books were his students. My aim isn't to great, create a great, glorious empire in the, name of G in the name of Andy Palmer. Who cares? I want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. That'll only happen as we learn to delegate. And that'll only happen if godly individuals step up and say, let's do this. And we go, yeah. Let's pray. Father, I praise you that your Holy Spirit has gifted us, each and every one of us, with a different personality, a different capacity, a different passion, a different set of gifts and abilities. And Lord, we want to each use these in a way which is sacrificial, but in a way which doesn't burn us out. So Lord, as we think about this next stage of life as a church, we think about creating these various different ministry teams I pray, Lord, you would raise up the right leaders. People who love you. People who aren't in it for themselves. But people who are willing to have a go. Lord, I pray that as a result of our attempts to go and tell the gospel in Balaam, there'll be many more who come to saving faith in you like Jethro did. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.